Hi everybody. Welcome to Ordinary Differential Equations, the mathematical framework and tools for understanding, modeling, and predicting anything that moves. Hi. We finished Chapter 2, but in this lecture I want to consider the problems at the end of Chapter 2 and give you some hints for doing them and tell you what I expect you to get out of doing each problem. So problem set two. The first problem, I consider an equilibrium point that has a homoclinic connection, a homoclinic orbit. Okay, so the question is, if you take any point on the homoclinic orbit that's not the equilibrium point, can that point reach the equilibrium point, reach means flow in time or evolve in time along the homoclinic trajectory, can it reach the equilibrium point in a finite time? Now there's a lot you can get out of this problem. The answer is no. And the reason why it's no is because if it could reach the equilibrium point in a finite time, that would violate uniqueness of solutions because you just go to the point where they meet and let them evolve backwards in time. And you have a con you you would have one point having two different futures or backward two different past of evolution. And that you cannot have. Okay, simple. But this is one of the points of autonomous equations and the flow property. And you can make a very elegant proof using the flow property for this problem. Trajectories cannot cross. Very important. Of course, you need to be careful with what you mean about cannot cross. So what I mean is they cannot occupy the same point in phase space at the same time. Two trajectories cannot cross. Okay, and that's a big deal. A lot of th a lot, there are a lot of consequences from that. But what about non-autonomous systems? Can they cross? Can they occupy the same point in phase space? Yes, that makes them complicated, but not at the same time, at different times, because the vector field is not just in a fixed direction for autonomous systems at a fixed point. It's moving around in time. Big difference in uh, behavior. Okay, next problem. Can an autonomous vector field on the real line that has no equilibrium points have periodic orbits? No. Why? Well, it would have to turn around on the real line, turn around and come back. And that cannot happen. Now you're going to have to make mathematical what I need say what I mean by can't turn around and come back. So there's got to be some point where the vector field is pointing in two directions at the same time for an autonomous system. That can't happen. You can you can fix up that argument a bit. Do I really need in this statement this problem that it has no equilibrium points? I'm going to leave that to you. For if you need that to conclude that there are no periodic orbits. No, I don't. Okay, can a non-autonomous vector field on the real line that has no equilibrium points have periodic orbits? Yes. Big difference now between autonomous and non-autonomous on the real line. Just make an example. When anyone asks you, can this happen? You know, you can think about some elaborate proof under all conditions, but just make an example. How about uh, x dot equal cosine t? Try that. Maybe you want to generalize a bit. Okay, problem four. Can an autonomous vector field on the circle that has no equilibrium points have periodic orbits? This one is a sort of a subtle one. It, it tends to trip up students. But yes, every orbit is periodic because it just goes round and round and round on the circle and always coming back to where it was. Periodic. Periodicity. In the phase space variable. Okay, problem five and six. This, you're actually solving a linear constant coefficient ODE. You probably did this in your first year calculus course, 
but you're looking at it in a slightly different point of view. I want you to find the flow generated by this equation. And it's a linear equation, and the flow is linear. It's a linear transformation for each t, and I write, write it in matrix form, which reveals that. You may need to look at Appendix B to uh, revise what you know about solving linear consequent efficient equ equations. We'll come back, and we'll use this quite a bit as, we, uh, as the course goes on. Not in the next couple of chapters, but later on. And then... And I ask you some simple things, like does the flow obey the time shift property? We proved that abstractly. We did it for a one-dimensional example, e to the x dot equals ax. The solution is x naught e to the at. Uh, but you know, I want you to verify it and uh, verify these, uh, these two bullet points here. Similarly, for a very related problem, I want you to do exactly the same thing. Compute the flow and show that it obeys the time shift property and find the initial condition for the time shifted flow. Okay, x naught y naught is just the initial condition we start with, but for the time shifted flow. Okay. Problem seven is a is to ask you to do prove generally that trajectories cannot cross each other. For autonomous vector fields, and you have to make mathematical what you mean by dot cross each other, and this is a good practice because you can you can think about things, uh, you know, uh, you you want to be able to prove things with mathematics, so you have to cast them in the form where you can give a mathematical proof. The time shift property, uh, the flow property, property three is something you use for this. It makes it fairly straightforward. Problem 8, 9, and 10, we had the notion of an invariant set um, um, for all time, positive and negative. And uh, we have positive invariant sets and so on. But 8, show that the union of two invariant sets is an invariant set. This gets back to where you have to formulate it mathematically to give a proof. Show that the intersection two invariant sets and an invariant set. Eight might have seemed pretty clear, but nine, maybe a nine sound is a little more tricky. And 10, show that the complement of a positive invariant set is a negative invariant set. So eight, nine, and 10 are, well, seven, eight, nine, and 10 are good examples of, uh, they, they give you a good knowledge of how to work with the qualitative theory of ODEs because these little building blocks you use constantly when you're doing uh, geometric analysis, but it forces you to make these statements in plain English mathematical so you can construct a proof. Okay, good luck and have fun with these problems, and next time we start chapter three. Bye for now.